This video is brought to you by Nebula, where you can watch the brand new series I produced and starred in called Archaeology Quest. Bless the Maker and his water. Bless the coming and going of him. May his passage cleanse the world. May he keep the world for his people. This is a prayer recited by the native inhabitants of Arrakis, the planet also known as Dune. The Fremen give this blessing as the colossal Shai Hulud breaks through the surface of the sand, spreading the prized spice melange across the desert planet. This psychedelic substance has many uses, from prolonging one's life to enhancing their mental capabilities. By ingesting spice, the guild navigators are able to travel in deep space and the Bene Gesserit are granted their impressive powers. And as the makers of this valuable substance, Shai Hulud, also known as sandworms, are considered to be the most important organism in the entirety of the known universe. Of course, this is not the universe as we know it, but the one in the science fiction world of Dune. The universe Frank Herbert created has extended well beyond the page, into the hearts and minds of millions of fans around the world. Many of them have spent a good deal of time contemplating the details of the book, agonizing over plot points, and imagining life on such a harsh planet. And while Herbert has given fans much to think about, there are a lot of unknowns, including details about the biology of the universe's most renowned creatures. What we do know is that sandworms are one of the largest animals in the universe. Their sizes vary from 100 to over 400 meters in length, with some reports of worms reaching half a league, or around 2,500 meters. Their skin is a series of overlapping scales, each about 1 to 3 meters wide, that create a strong, impenetrable armor, protecting the sandworm from abrasion of the surrounding sand. And each of their body segments is capable of life on its own. Their mouths can extend up to 80 meters in diameter, and are lined with crystalline teeth capable of devouring man and machine. If you're lucky, you may be able to detect their approach and make your escape. They often cause dry lightning through a discharge of static electricity, and their odor of spice fills the air. And then, the sand begins to vibrate, and by then, it might be too late. And for such an enormous creature, they begin life on a much smaller scale. Their first stage of life is sand plankton. These are microscopic organisms that feed on spice melange on the surface of the desert. They are eaten by sandworms, but also burrow into the sand and become sand trout, which are also known as little makers. In this stage, they are described by Herbert as half plant, half animal. They create water pockets within the sand, which when mixed with their bile, becomes pre-spice mass. They also emit gases that eventually build up and result in spice blows, which brings the pre-spice mass to the surface, often in extraordinary, lethal eruptions. Here, the sun and air turn it into spice. While many sand trout die during these blows, some survive and grow into the behemoth sandworms. While all of this background information is certainly enough for a series of novels, it's missing specific details that explain the sandworm's unusual biology. Luckily, Herbert's dedicated fanbase spans all professions, including biologists. And some have spent a significant amount of time attempting to fill in the blanks left by Herbert by using what they know about animals here on Earth. One of the main questions many people have wondered with these worms is, how can they be so big? On Earth, the largest land animal is believed to have been the dinosaur Argentinosaurus. Though a complete skeleton hasn't been discovered yet, estimates based on the fossils we currently have put it at 37 to 40 meters in length and 90 to 100 metric tons. In the sea, animals can get even bigger, since their weight is partly supported by water, which is why the largest animal ever to live on Earth lives in the ocean. The blue whale can reach up to 33 meters long and weigh 180 metric tons. But still, the sandworm dwarfs them both. So is it even possible for an animal to reach that size? Technically, it is possible, but there are biological and mechanical obstacles the animal would need to overcome. The first is a structural support system. 
if a 33-meter blue whale weighs 180 metric tons, one can only imagine how much a 400 by 80 meter sandworm might weigh. To carry around that much mass and move around, especially at the rapid pace these giants are known for traveling, you need an incredibly strong skeletal system. While the description of sandworms brings to mind Earth's annelids, which include worms or possibly arthropods like centipedes, it would be incredibly unlikely for either of these types of animals to reach the colossal size of a sandworm. Annelids have a hydroskeleton, which maintains their shape by keeping water or fluid under constant pressure. This would be impossible to maintain on a dry desert planet. Arthropods have a hard exoskeleton, but since they molt as they grow, making them vulnerable while waiting for a new exoskeleton to harden, scientists believe there's a size limit to how big an animal with an exoskeleton can be. The largest in the world is the Japanese spider crab which is just 3.5 meters wide. In addition, the exoskeleton would have to be incredibly thick to support all their weight, which would leave little room for other important body parts like organs. Instead, a sandworm would probably contain an internal skeletal structure and be more similar to a snake, which is consistent with its scaly exterior. Since bones are made up of living tissue, they grow as the animal grows. This would, theoretically, allow the sandworms to grow continuously. However, there is a structural consideration that may prevent this. In physics, the longer a beam is, the more it will sag. For example, a 5cm beam will sag 1300 times less than a 2 meter beam with the same cross-sectional area. To avoid sagging, the bones of larger animals are bulkier and heavier, making up a larger proportion of the animal's overall body weight. To put this into perspective, scientists estimate that a small sandworm's bones would be about 40% of its body weight, compared to about 18% for an average human man. This would make it impossible for sandworms to move, that is, if they were made of calcium like our bones. But they might be made of something else entirely. In a 2007 essay, a biologist named Sabeel Hetchel speculated that sandworms must have bones made of something stronger than calcium, such as metal, which would reduce their diameter and, depending on the metal, their weight. However, they would need a diet rich in metals to be able to produce metallic bones. So perhaps the sand on Arrakis contains more metals than the sand here on Earth. Or the harvesters they're known for eating provide them with enough of these metals. But even with all the structural support in the world, there's another problem. How such a gigantic creature can regulate its body temperature. As muscles flex and contract, they generate heat. This is typically released to the cooler environment through the skin. If it didn't, the body's temperature would rise to dangerous levels, leading to heat stroke or even death. But how do you expel internal heat if you live in an environment where the ambient temperature is much higher than your body's? The temperature of the sand on Arrakis can reach 76 degrees Celsius, or 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Sandworms' extra-large muscles and organs would create a lot of internal heat, and the unforgiving desert environment of Arrakis would make it incredibly hard to release it. On Earth, many animals have developed ways to regulate their temperature. These include mechanisms like flat appendages that can act as heat exchangers, like the ears of elephants. These methods are especially important for large animals, who have a bigger volume-to-surface area ratio than small animals. Other animals on Earth resort to sweating to keep cool. But there's one big problem with this and the dune sandworms. Water kills them. In fact, they're not water-based lifeforms at all. It's hinted that they're not even carbon-based lifeforms. There's something in the ecology appendix about carbon-based proteins being incompatible and toxic to them. And since water is toxic to them, sweating is out of the question. So maybe they use evaporative cooling with a liquid other than water? Or maybe as a non-water-based lifeform, and not even a carbon-based lifeform, they can withstand the heat. Maybe they even need it. The book describes hot chemical furnaces churning inside the worm, so perhaps there is a purpose for their internal heat. For instance, it could be used to drive the chemical reactions in their body. Our own bodies require certain temperatures for our enzymes to work. 
These are proteins that accelerate chemical reactions, and they typically perform best at 37 degrees Celsius. While earthly proteins break down at around 40 degrees Celsius, perhaps the sandworms are equipped with proteins or comparable unknown molecules that need furnace-like conditions. These reactions are also supposedly what creates the planet's supply of oxygen. On Earth, plants create oxygen through photosynthesis. In this process, they take in carbon dioxide and water and use energy from the sun to create sugars and carbohydrates. These are long-chain molecules composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The extra oxygen atom gets released into the atmosphere. Arrakis doesn't have many plants, yet it still contains enough oxygen to support life. Noticing this oddity in the novel, the planet's ecologist Liet Kynes predicted the presence of an underground organism capable of producing oxygen. This ended up being the sand trout. But since they live underground, they can't be using the sun's energy to create oxygen. So how do they do it? While Herbert described them as half plant, half animal, fans postulate that they may actually have more in common with bacteria. That is, a particular type called chemoautotrophic bacteria, which produce oxygen without the sun. They are also known as extremophiles due to living in harsh environments like deep sea vents. They create energy by oxidizing chemicals like hydrogen sulfide, methane, and ammonia. They then use this energy, the water produced during the oxidation process, and carbon dioxide to make sugars and carbohydrates while releasing oxygen. It's likely that some of the same chemicals are also released from underground vents on Arrakis. So perhaps the sand trout are able to use them in the same way and create oxygen as a byproduct. But being a fairly sizable organism, the sand trout also likely need to eat something to be able to produce pre-spice mass. Sand plankton is said to eat the spice, and the sandworms ingest the sand plankton, so what about the sand trout? As the makers of the spice, it wouldn't make sense that they eat that as well. So maybe there's another organism involved, one that both feeds the sand trout and helps it to create the pre-spice mass. In her essay, the biologist Dr. Hetchel pointed out that most of Earth's exotic compounds come from plants, bacteria, and fungi. So what if the same was true for Arrakis? There are lots of examples of symbiotic relationships between these types of organisms and animals. One famous example is the leafcutter ant. These ants act as farmers for certain species of fungi. They bring pieces of leaves into their underground nests and keep them moist so that the fungus will grow on them. After the fungus digests the cellulose in the leaves, which the ants cannot do themselves, the ants eat it. So perhaps there's a fungus growing underground in the sand trout's water pockets. This could serve as their food, as well as the source for the pre-spice mass. Of course, this and the other theories mentioned in this video are just that, theories. But that's what makes books like Dune so lovable. After they're completed by the author, groups of fans come together to discuss their favorite parts, look for plot holes, and develop their own concepts to fill them. This video has been a big experiment for me. Being on camera is sort of new. The whole time we were filming this, all I could think about was how much is the normal human amount to move my eyebrows. Maybe some people know how to not feel like an alien when doing this stuff, but not me. But I'm sort of just embracing feeling like an alien because I recently learned how fun it can be to do new types of shows in new formats. I recently got to produce and star in a ridiculous, ambitious, funny, but still educational Nebula original show called Archaeology Quest about experimental archaeology, where me and my co-writer Lorraine compete against each other in Paleolithic tasks, from making stone tools, to throwing spears, to foraging mushrooms. We do our absolute best to learn from top experimental archaeology experts about these things, but at the end of the day, we are not that good at most of these things. <laughs> the mushroom foraging episode just got released, and you can see for yourselves how many times each of us would have died based on the mushrooms we oh so confidently collected. This episode and the previous three are available exclusively on Nebula. I can't express how important Nebula is to our small business and to me as a person trying to grow, learn new things, and get out of my anxious alien comfort zone. 
Nebula allows me to take risks like this and produce videos that would definitely not fit on this real science YouTube channel. They believe in me, believe in my ideas, and completely made Archaeology Quest possible. YouTube is great for lots of reasons, but at the end of the day, it can be stifling. You can feel penalized by the algorithm for trying new ideas. So without Nebula, I probably would never have gotten the confidence to start appearing in videos. Without Nebula, our business probably wouldn't have made it this far at all. So signing up to Nebula is simply different than signing up to other YouTube sponsors you might see. It supports us in so many ways. Financially, yes, but also spiritually and creatively. For anyone who's already a subscriber, I want you to know just how appreciated it is. And for existing Nebula subscribers and new subscribers alike, right now Nebula is offering lifetime memberships. For $300, you'll get Nebula for as long as both you and Nebula exist. This is a way for us to raise capital for the amazing, creator-owned projects Nebula is on a roll with greenlighting. Things like Archaeology Quest. This is the best way to not have to worry about a monthly payment and ensure you get access to everything Nebula will ever produce. But for anyone not wanting to spend that much, there are also monthly and yearly subscriptions. If you sign up using the link below, you can get 40% off annual plans, a little over $2.5 per month. This allows you to support this channel directly while getting both Nebula and Nebula classes. So go to nebula.tv realscience to sign up now.